here and let you all know that this program is being recorded. Dr. Kohlmeyer. Thank you all. This is really a lot of fun. Uh, I will have to prepare my quarantini a little bit later, but I think it still counts. And uh, it looks very delicious. I do want to share some of what I learned about uh, nutrition and COVID-19 because COVID-19 kind of surprised us all and uh, we all were learning as month after month uh, the pandemic uh, continued. Can I have the, first, the next slide? So what I want to talk about and what you, I hope, can learn about this is how nutrition strengthens innate antiviral immunity what may reduce risk of infection with the SARS-2, CoV-2 uh, virus, why some infectious patients have worse outcomes, and then a little few details here and there. Next one. So this is just uh, to kick it off as a reminder how it all started. Uh, sometime early in December last year, uh, a new virus emerged in China, and uh, towards the end of the year, uh, the first cases were seriously uh, um, identified. It took about seven days, literally just a week, uh, to completely sequence it and understand that it was a new virus, and the rest is history. Next one. So I just want to cover uh, very briefly some of the basics about the virus. Uh, basically, it's important to understand that the virus can survive on surf surfaces uh, for many hours, and in some cases, particularly when it's cold, uh, for several days, and that explains some of its high uh, infectivity. Incubation period is two to 14 days. That's a widespread, the average is six days. So it's a little bit difficult to know uh, after exposure when you might have uh, dodged the bullet uh, because it can take two weeks, in some cases even longer. Most children and young adults have minimal symptoms. And only a minority of those who are affected actually have any kind of even minimal fever. Um, dry cough or diarrhea are additional uh, typical symptoms. And then there is a, a minority who has uh, severe symptoms and uh, they may even be worsening after several days. Uh, this happens uh, particularly in older people, but it is important uh, to remember uh, that everybody, regardless of age, can get infected and can get severe COVID-19 disease. Next slide. Everyone is at risk as long as there's virus exposure. And the way we protect ourselves is washing our hands frequently with soap and warm, warm water. We do want to use masks that pro uh, provides protection for others, less for ourselves. That's just being good citizens. And now we come to the topic and we want to talk about today, that is good nutrition slows transmission, but it also ameliorates outcomes. Next slide. So to give you a little bit extra time uh, to look at this complex slide, and we will uh, talk about it in more detail, we want to do a little poll 
uh, today. And I would like to know how many of you are taking vitamin D supplements? Take your time. And I'm while you are responding, I'm going to talk a little bit about the science. So there are several phases uh, that occur when somebody has been exposed to the virus. And we are talking about early and late stages of fending off the virus or responding to it. The first stage, which happens immediately, is determined by the innate immunity. And then within a week or so, uh, we may develop or usually develop antibodies, which can clear the infection. I'm just looking at the poll. Excellent. Thanks to all who are, have taken part in this. And it's almost half and half. Very interesting. We will come back to that. Thank you. So, the virus uh, enters the body through uh, epithelial cells, particularly those lining uh, the respiratory tract. And mostly they enter through the ACE2 uh, complex, uh, which is in the cell membrane. So basically all cells uh, that express ACE2 uh, are susceptible to infection, not just uh, the respiratory epithelia. If cells get infected, uh, the virus can multiply, uh, replicate in large numbers, and uh, eventually uh, the cell may burst and bring forth many, many more viruses. That doesn't take very long, a uh, few hours, and that is how a lot of the proliferation uh, proceeds. And here we have some defenses uh, that work right away, even if we are not immune against the virus. And these include particularly peptides that work very generally against viruses. And I don't want to get into the details. And also uh, immune cells that can very unspecifically act against the virus, particularly natural killer cells. You see it uh, brown, uh, bottom left, NK. And above that, cytotoxic lymphocytes, both of which uh, help to fend off the uh, virus. But then the next phase is very important, that is macrophages and dendritic cells in the epithelium and in skin, et cetera, uh, start processing the virus. And uh, they do uh, also produce uh, a number of uh, peptides that protect the body against the virus. So some of them slow the replication, uh, others uh, uh, eliminate it. Uh, completely. But um, ultimately, these macrophages and dendritic cells will process parts of the virus presented to the immune system on the right and through a cascading system, eventually produce uh, plasma cells that can generate immune globulins. And these are uh, the proteins, of course, that give us uh, lasting immunity and then easily uh, triggered again uh, when there is a later exposure in, in immune uh, people. But all of these processes take quite some time and typically it takes about a week or 10 days until enough immunity 
has been generated. So that's the last slide uh, that I'm really going to bother you, you know, with all those details, but I think it's important to understand what is going on. And what is important to understand is that a number of nutrients are needed by this system to make these cells function and also proliferate. And particularly vitamins A and D and E are important for this. And uh, as we are going to talk more about vitamin D, it is also important that these cells are able to activate vitamin D. So they basically provide their own supply of activated vitamin D uh, and act on various uh, of these cells. Next. So let's get to the vitamin D and uh, think about what we're dealing with here. Next slide. First uh, that I need to really emphasize is that cholecalciferol, the natural form of vitamin D, is actually a pro-hormone. It's not a vitamin. So it's very similar uh, in terms of function, like for instance, cortisol or other hormones. And the way these hormones work, uh, as you can see in this sketch, they interact directly with DNA in cells, usually as a complex with retinoic acid coming from vitamin D, uh, vitamin A, and uh, increase the production of certain DNA products. The other thing that we need to know, and uh, most of you probably already know it, that vitamin D uh, that may be ingested or coming from sunlight needs to be activated. Uh, two hydroxy groups are added, and then you have the fully functional hormone. Next one. So where is vitamin D coming from? It's coming particularly from uh, skin, produced in the skin that is irradiated by ultraviolet light, UVB, that is short wavelength uh, ultraviolet light. And this acts on the precursor of cholesterol, a direct precursor of cholesterol, breaking open the ring system. And if you follow the arrow down below, uh, you can see the ring system opens up and voila, you have vitamin D. If that wasn't done, then the final step of cholesterol synthesis could proceed and cholesterol would be uh, produced from the same precursor. What you can see here is, of course, some people desperately trying to get some sun sunlight, some uh, ultraviolet B. And this is uh, at very high latitude, uh, actually in Russia, uh, 60 degrees uh, latitude north. And as you can see, the shadows are falling uh, exactly behind these people, which means the sunlight comes uh, very on a very shallow uh, angle. So it comes flat. So that would be like in the mornings, if you get up at seven o'clock and see the sun is, is just coming uh, at you. And at that angle, too much has to pass through the atmosphere and very little ultraviolet components are left. And so these people have to stand up, but they're still, as you can see, quite pale they also don't really produce very much uh, vitamin D. So we want to do another poll. And this one is asking, have a moment, how much time you spend outside during a typical week?
And it is very important to understand that uh, sun exposure is, is really most effective during the middle of the day, typically between 11 and 2 uh, in the afternoon. And uh, before and, and after that, it becomes less effective because the angle of the sun gets lower and lower. And as you've seen uh, for the Russia uh, sunbathers, uh, that is not as effective. It's also important to remember that if you use a lot of sunscreen, sunscreen is very effective. It does exactly its job and it blocks much uh, of the vitamin D production. This is exciting. Thank you very much. So uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, there are not very many hours in the day. But uh, let me just say that uh, about 15 minutes uh, in North Carolina during the summer is more than enough uh, during you know, midday hours to generate as much as 50 or 100,000 units of vitamin D, so, which is a ton, it's a lot. So you don't need very many hours. It's nice to be outside and uh, get a stroll, but uh, you don't need to spend many hours to get enough vitamin D. And we do want to minimize exposure uh, to excessive vitamin D, uh, to keep our skin uh, safe uh, and good looking. Next one. We can close this. Thank you. So why would we be interested in avoiding vitamin D deficiency? Well, probably most of you uh, are quite familiar with uh, the weakening of bones, particularly with aging uh, that we refer to as osteoporosis. Uh, but there's also a loss of muscle strength and an increased risk of falls in older people. Vitamin D can help to reduce that number, and many people uh, have uh, great harm, uh, hospitalization, and even death with those falls. What we also know is that uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, is associated with earlier death, and not least due to respiratory tract infections. So that could be pneumonia, uh, flu, and currently uh, COVID-19. There are several other conditions that also are associated with uh, vitamin D deficiency in some people, such as worsening of depression or uh, linked to multiple sclerosis, uh, there are a number of other things. So we have good reason to really avoid vitamin D deficiency. Next slide. So how much do we need and where does it come from? The minimum that is currently rec recommended by the Institute of Medicine that takes care of our nutrition recommendations is 600 to 800 units per day. People over 70 should get more than 800 units. And if we compare that how much we get from food, then we realize food providing only 100 to 200 units, that you do need uh, sunlight and you do need the ultraviolet light. And we often talk about vitamin D winter which is not related necessarily to how cold it is, but how little ultraviolet light uh, is available, because this is the period where no production in skin is possible. And depending on where you are uh, down here, that may be one to two months, but further up north, like in Canada, it may be as much as four to six months. Uh, per year. 
So it really makes a difference where you live. And then, of course, wearing coverings. So if you always wear hats and cover up, uh, sunscreen, and also staying indoors, uh, of course, limits production. And this is a problem, particularly for older people who may be uh, confined uh, to indoors. Next slide. So just to give you a sense of how much uh, the time of the year and uh, where you live makes a difference, if you look at the bottom, you can see that for much of the winter and spring, uh, people there in, in uh, England and Ireland have fairly low vitamin D concentrations uh, when we measure them. It is significantly more uh, in the US, even in the north. So if you look at the curve, uh, 42 degrees north in Boston, Massachusetts, and it is, of course, a little bit better uh, in uh, our region. Uh, doesn't make much difference if you go much further south because we already usually get enough. Next slide. So in terms of when you're actually looking uh, at uh, blood concentrations, uh, skin tone, we immediately see there is a major difference even in the South. These uh, values were measured in South Florida, uh, pretty much as far South as it goes in uh, the US. And you can see white people in the winter have uh, some uh, percentage of uh, vitamin D deficiency. That's about 25% or so. But if you compare that with the bar on the right, you can see that black, darker skinned people are almost always uh, suffering from uh, vitamin D deficiency. Uh, Latinos, Mexican Americans, in this particular study, we're about halfway in between, and uh, this is quite typical. Next. So this confirms uh, in a nationally representative study that uh, across all ages, non-Hispanic whites have much uh, higher vitamin D concentration in the column on the left. So there it's about uh, in children, 35 minutes, uh, 35 uh, nanogram per milliliter, compared to only 18 uh, in children and young uh, people uh, who have darker skin. And people who are older, also tend to have much lower uh, vitamin D concentration. And you even there see quite a distinct difference uh, in darker skinned people. Uh, there almost everybody has uh, vitamin D deficiency in the winter and also in some other times the year. Next. Another factor that is very important is body fat. We have known for quite a while, and these uh, data have uh, told us that, that as people uh, have more body fat and getting more obese, uh, they have a harder time getting enough vitamin D simply because the body fat sequesters uh, the vitamin D. In black people, the difference is less clear. Uh, maybe because they already have such a high prevalence uh, of vitamin D deficiency. So uh, higher body fat is definitely a risk factor for uh, vitamin D deficiency. Next. The good news is that even uh, obese people, and they were studied here, and make up for the, for the difference, uh, it's only a matter of the amount of additional vitamin D that
that is consumed. So even if people have a low starting point, they can get almost any uh, vitamin D concentration that may be helpful. What you see here is the increment with different levels, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 uh, IU per day. Uh, so we can actually help people uh, reach a desirable vitamin D level with a dietary supplement. The amounts may really differ between people depending on uh, their skin tone and on their uh, body fat level uh, and a couple of other factors that we are going to get to. Next. So this is confirming with 800 units that people with fairly low concentration uh, can achieve adequate concentration. And the concentration that would be adequate is indicated by the broken line above. But uh, it takes actually at least these 800 units, particularly if you're starting low, depending where you live. This was done in Nebraska, in the middle of the country. Uh, so the starting point uh, is important. What is significant here is that it takes weeks to actually achieve those levels. So it doesn't happen right away. So uh, the first day or five days that you start using a supplement will not achieve the full benefit uh, with increased vitamin D concentration. Next. And I would be amiss if I didn't mention genetics. Uh, I mean, at our institute, we always have to uh, mention genetics. Uh, I think that's a requirement. We were able to demonstrate uh, that a very common genetic variant uh, really makes a difference. On the left, you see the baseline uh, in a, a group of uh, Caucasian people. And you can see uh, the dark colored bar with a, a genotype of AA of this uh, variant uh, is associated with very low vitamin D concentrations, about 16 nanogram uh, per milliliters, uh, just as uh, for reference, 10 nanograms would constitute severe vitamin deficiency. But the people who uh, do not have this variant on the left, lighter blue, uh, they have no problem. They have much higher uh, typical uh, vitamin D concentration. And what is important to compare, these people received 800 units for two years. And you can see on the right, this set of bars, again, the dark blue with uh, the uh, risk uh, genotype to two alleles of the A variant, they barely achieve the vitamin D concentration that the people without this variant have without any supplementation. And you can see that it takes at least 800 units or so uh, to even get to an average uh, concentration. So genetics do make uh, a big difference. And these variants are very common. Uh, in this case, two A alleles are uh, typically present in about 8% uh, uh, of Caucasian Americans. Next slide. So getting to the nub of it. Uh, what is the role of vitamin D and infection with COVID? Where are we? Next slide. We have very limited uh, information. And I do want to emphasize that uh, we cannot really use information about other viruses because every virus is different. So what we know, for instance, about the flu is not very helpful because the behavior is not comparable. So it is very good to see slowly some data coming in 
uh, directly related uh, to COVID-19. And what you can see here is from a study from the UK, uh, that is the UK Biobank study, where about half a million people uh, were uh, recruited uh, and they had vitamin D concentrations measured uh, sometime before uh, this year, uh, somewhere between one year and several years. So this is just predictive. And then the question was, what was their risk of getting infected? And what you can see is a severe deficiency and that's uh, uh, the middle line, the middle row, less than 25 nanomole per liter, which is 10 nanogram per milliliter. Uh, they have at least a third higher risk of getting infected. If the deficiency was a little bit less uh, severe, you still have uh, an increased uh, risk. Next slide. Very recently, an, another current uh, study uh, was published where actual vitamin D concentrations were measured. And then uh, it was uh, seen that uh, those with lower concentration had increased risk. In this case, uh, the increase of the risk was uh, more than 50% uh, of getting an infection with COVID-19. Now, this is interesting because this was done in Israel, where, of course, uh, sun exposure is much more similar to what we have here. So these data really kind of, kind of support that even in sunny regions, there always are people who are vitamin D deficient and then actually have an increased risk of getting infected. Next slide. So let's put that into current context. Uh, it is very interesting to see how in other countries uh, the uh, infections uh, evolve and develop. In the UK, uh, we have fairly good monitoring. And what you see on the top, these are current data from a couple of days ago or up to a couple of days ago, is that after the summer of relatively low number of infections, uh, the number of infections, daily new infections, have risen dramatically to currently more than 3,000 new infections per day. And uh, in the summer, it was in the hundreds. And if you compare what happened earlier in the year, then you can see that in May and June, uh, the infections, all, the rate of infections always, also was high. We know that. But now we can look at a relationship with season. So the summer obviously uh, greatly decreased the number of infections. But maybe more interestingly, if you look at the figure below, these are vitamin D concentrations that are typically found ac during the, across the year. And as we have seen before, uh, in the winter and early spring, vitamin D concentrations are very low, then they're increasing. In the summer, they are high, but they are already declining now. And that parallels very closely what is happening with vitamin D infection numbers. So yes, there is a strong element of how be people behave. If there's a lot of partying, yes, anybody can get infected, but clearly there's a strong seasonal uh, element. And we can now more confidently link that to vitamin D status. So if you have a low vitamin D status, your risk is 
probably significantly higher. And even you know, for an entire country like in the UK, that can be demonstrated. Next. So what are the consequences? Uh, there has been a lot of debate of, you know, why should some groups be concerned if you're young and don't have any kind of pre-existing condition, maybe you just don't need to worry. And that is true to some extent. Next slide. We know that young people who have no risk factors uncommonly have bad outcomes. But the risk factors are very common and you might recognize some of those in yourself. And they include right at the top high blood pressure, overweight and obesity, diabetes, older age, dark skin, and male gender. And now we can confidently add nutrition uh, deficiencies, uh, particularly vitamin D, but also other nutrients that just part of good nutrition. Next slide. Let me just uh, demonstrate uh, the impact of obesity, uh, which of course is very prevalent in the US and in our region in particular. And if you compare normal weight people, uh, open bar on the left, uh, with uh, the closed bar, the black uh, filled bar on the right, then you can see it almost doubles uh, the number of patient, infected patients requiring ventilation. And of course, we all know uh, that many of those requiring ventilation eventually will die. And this is regardless uh, of uh, uh, age group. You can see similar patterns across different age groups. Uh, so an older man uh, who is obese with diabetes and hypertension, of course, uh, has a potential problem. Next slide. So what about the vitamin D? We now have the first uh, randomized controlled trial that has been completed, and this in Spain, uh, re using adequate vitamin D at the time of diagnosis. And what you can see on the left uh, column, that half of those participants uh, who did not get any extra vitamin D needed uh, to be treated in an ICU. Only half of them did not. And compare that uh, with the participants with these patients who were treated uh, with vitamin D as they were diagnosed and admitted to the hospital, almost none of them needed ICU treatment. None of them needed uh, artificial respiration. So this is uh, the first fully uh, uh, configured, fully sized and fully powered uh, randomized controlled trial that very, clearly, uh, very clearly demonstrates that vitamin D plays a major role, not only in the infections, but probably even more importantly in the outcomes. Next slide. And these are our own uh, results that we have taken from public statistics. And you can kind of see a confirmation from the early month uh, of this pandemic. And basically, if you divide the US by latitude, uh, cutting it about at 39 degrees north, blue line, you can see that uh, in the north, about 45 uh, people per 100,000 died from COVID-19. But in the south, only five. And this is an enormous uh, difference. And these differences are persist uh, if you separate out 
black population from white population. Uh, and again, in the black population who are particularly uh, seriously affected by this pandemic, you can see that in the North, more than 100 people per 100,000, that's one in a thousand, died just in the first few months of this year, compared to 13 in the South. The difference is pretty proportional in uh, white populations, but you similarly uh, have much more death in the North than in the South. So next slide. What we found very early, and this was published in May, uh, that there is a particular uh, latitude gradient for uh, people of color. So uh, black people living in the North, as you've seen before, are much more likely uh, to die from uh, COVID-19 and the excess mortality uh, between black and white populations uh, is clearly related to where they live in the north versus the south. Next slide. So to conclude, where are we now? We have to state very clearly that using masks, hand washing, social distancing, and other preventive measures still are the first uh, choice. That should be our number one priority. We should not feel something that we are using kind of, kind of protects us. We have to actively do something to protect ourselves. That said, adequate vitamin D status is important as I hope uh, I could uh, demonstrate here. But very important, more is not better. There is no indication that either uh, getting particularly uh, much uh, UV exposure, sunlight, or using very high dose uh, vitamin D supplements is not helpful. It doesn't do any more. A relatively modest amount is enough. 15, 20 minutes of nice uh, midday sunlight uh, and uh, enough vitamin D as a supplement. I would suggest everybody should consider a moderately, moderately dosed supplement with typically 600,000 units. Uh, up to 4,000 units is safe, but there is no benefit that we know of uh, that would suggest that we even need that much. So coming around, to our final poll. Of course, I wonder, has this presentation convinced you, if you haven't done so already, to start using a vitamin D supplement daily? We just emphasize vitamin D supplements can be bought over the counter. They're very inexpensive. You don't need a particularly special and expensive uh, supplements. Um, if you want to uh, buy some, use the brands that are uh, reliable, but there is no problem usually with uh, vitamin D. Aha, so more than half of you already take vitamin D, so you heard me talking, or maybe I heard you talking. And a few still need a little bit more consideration. And with that, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Martin. Um, it turns out that we have a bunch of questions that have come in while you were speaking. So I will throw those your way and we will, um, I'm just going to kind of take them as they came in. So we have one question that came in that says, 
how reliable are plasma biomarkers of vitamin D? And how does this impact our ability to reliably assess estimates of vitamin D deficiency in the population? So like with any kind of measurements, it depends on how it's done and who does it. Uh, there is a difference if we do uh, research. So we use all kinds of precautions and standardization. If you go to your uh, uh, physician, uh, then it depends on the lab, but generally speaking, uh, those measurements are pretty reliable uh, if you take it with a grain of salt. If you currently have uh, indications of vitamin D deficiency, you definitely should uh, start using a supplement. Uh, it's very unlikely that these data are wrong. I have to say, I'm not in favor of a lot of testing uh, for the general public because the tests are relatively expensive. But there's nothing wrong with it. Thank you. The next question that came in through Q&A is, my heritage is British and I was born and lived the first 45 years of my life at 45, I'm assuming degrees north or above. So my pasty white skin is adaptive against vitamin D deficiency. Now that I live in the South with this pasty white skin, would you agree that I remain very efficient at vitamin D production, i.e. I retain the adaptation? And if so, will this efficiency be able to overcome the vitamin D inefficiency conferred by newly acquired obesity? So uh, number one, this adaptation is a genetic adaptation that doesn't change throughout life. So you, probably most of you know that your typical uh, skin tone uh, is inherited. You will probably see it in your family. So if you move from the UK uh, to the American South, uh, you're probably much better off as you've seen with uh, my vitamin D figures. Um, at the same time, if you are relatively pale, you do have to protect yourself against sunburn because sunburn, uh, whatever else is happening, is uh, harmful and increases your risk of skin cancer. Uh, talking about obesity, obesity is never good. Uh, we do know people who have added body weight need significantly more maybe twice as much or more uh, than people who are not obese. Wonderful, thank you again for that question answer. We have one, uh, another one from the Q&A section which says, are there any data on whether women who wear the burqa have vitamin D deficiency or have their systems adapted? They absolutely do. There are a lot of uh, studies actually um, in uh, Arab countries uh, and other countries that are uh, relatively far south. So uh, United Arab uh, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, there are uh, a good number of studies uh, that demonstrate that many people, women and men, because men uh, also wear a lot of uh, coverings, uh, at very high risk of vitamin D deficiency. I mean, if you don't expose skin, very often, particularly if it's thick cloth, uh, the UV will not penetrate. Thank you very much. Another Q&A question is, what is the allele frequency of the vitamin D AA genotype in African Americans and the Hispanic population? The, it's a very good question, very perceptive question. In the Hispanic uh, Latino population, uh, it is comparable, uh, somewhat comparable to other Caucasian uh, populations. However, uh, in people with African uh, heritage, uh, the system works very different. So we are currently trying to understand how to assess this 
which uh, genetic variations to use because there are other uh, variants uh, that are common there. And uh, you cannot just uh, extrapolate the findings in Caucasian people uh, to people from other regions or with other heritage. So this is uh, currently uh, an active concern at the NRI. You. And then we did have a few questions come in through the chat. With some of these, um, I do want to note that I, I, some of the questions are more specific, I think, to maybe someone's individual physician. But we had one question come in that said, I take 2000 IU of vitamin D3 for a vitamin deficiency. Is that enough for me? That can only be answered if uh, vitamin D concentration is actually measured without knowing the actual concentration, I would say probably. But uh, the various risk factors, uh, particularly uh, body composition, BMI, uh, and skin tone, uh, allow us some prediction. So if uh, the BMI is high, uh, you need much more. Um, we also received, can individuals be tested at the NRI for their genetic makeup and variants? I am Caucasian and spend a fair amount of time outside, yet have lower D levels with prescribed supplementation. That would be done in the context of our various research studies. So it cannot, cannot be done currently to order, but if uh, anybody participates in some of these uh, studies, that may be part of the study. We also so received always good to ask us and, and engage us. Can I participate in studies? So let me just uh, make it very clear. Uh, we are conducting studies. We are recruiting people for our various studies. Uh, our clinical services are up and running. Uh, so do ask us. Uh, there are several investigators who are looking for participants. Always, definitely. And as someone who has participated in some of the research studies, I can also recommend the experience. Now, I know we're coming up on seven o'clock, but we have three more questions, and I think that they're all very good questions to be asked, so I will share them with you. Someone is interested in knowing if children should take a supplement for vitamin D. That's a good question. So, uh, as you, as you have seen what I showed before, people, somebody wants a private audience here, uh, <laughs> uh, tend to have a better vitamin D status simply because they are much more outside. So uh, I would say uh, around here, if people uh, get enough exposure, they run around, etc., they probably don't need a dietary supplement. Uh, further in the north, absolutely. Wonderful. So we are talking about anything uh, uh, north of the DC area. Now, one other question here, could the link between vitamin D and COVID interactions also be true of vitamin D and the regular seasonal flu? That's why we, uh, very early on, uh, when I say we, I mean the research community, not just uh, our group, uh, look at this relationship because we know fairly, with fairly good certainty, that there is the same kind of relationship. And that has very much to do with that with the fact that vitamin D is very important for innate immunity which is the kind of immunity that does not depend on prior exposure. So basically those infections, including uh, sniffles and you know, common cold, et cetera, that uh, come with winter and go with summer, they're probably all responsive to vitamin D. 
Wonderful. And our final question of the evening, um, someone asked and said, this is more personal to me, but I think it could probably apply to lots of people. They said that they get sick when they take vitamin D supplements, even trying different companies. So besides sunlight, what can they do? I would say talk to your doctor because that's not the normal response. We know some uh, particular conditions that are not very common where uh, extra vitamin D is bad. Those need to be diagnosed uh, anyway. So I would suggest to anybody who has uh, any kind of suspected bad response to immediately uh, talk to their doctors and, you know, get a little bit uh, to the bottom of it. Wonderful. Well, that is all the questions that came through. And I just want to say thank you once more to you, Dr. Kohlmeyer, for being willing to speak with everyone this evening. I know I learned a lot and I was not taking a vitamin D supplement prior to this. So it is something I will have to add to my daily intake. Okay, good. Um, I, we have a maybe thank you a vacation <laughs> at, at the sunny beach. You know? Yes, I would welcome that for sure. Should I prescribe <laughs> it? Let's talk. I like it. We are receiving lots of thank you in the chat and I am going to pass it off to one final slide and to Suzanne Dean once more just to close us for the evening and I have to apologize for some reason our photo on this slide has disappeared. You're supposed to be seeing a beautiful image of the NRI so I'm sorry that you're not seeing that right now but Suzanne I will pass things off to you to close for the evening and you're still muted I'm sorry. There you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, we have missed you. For those uh, of our friends who've been with us a long time attending these programs in person, we have really missed being in the community with you. But uh, in some ways, this, there's always a silver lining. And uh, we have been able to connect with new friends who aren't in our immediate vicinity. And uh, so we're very excited. Um, that you were able to be with us tonight. And Dr. Kohlmeyer, thank you again. Uh, I think this was a really important and timely topic. Uh, I hope everybody found it as helpful as I did. I know that as I was reading your papers as they were coming out over the summer, um, I thought this was just uh, very compelling news that we wanted to share. So we were really um, pleased that you were available to deliver this program to our audience this evening. So thanks again for that. Um, you mentioned already that the NRI is open again for research studies, and I just want to reemphasize that um, for anybody who would like to know if there is a study that they uh, would be a good um, candidate for, you can visit our website at uncnri.org and click on the participate uh, button under the community tab. Uh, and all of the open um, studies that are recruiting participants are listed there with all of the, um, the things you would need to know to, if you are um, a good candidate. So also our next Appetite for Life program uh, will be a cooking demonstration and nutrition talk in collaboration with our friends at Johnson & Wales uh, University here in Charlotte. Um, and that's on Wednesday, October 21st uh, at 6 p.m. So watch your inbox for a notice uh, for when registration opens for that. And again, it will be virtual. So that'll be a whole new adventure for us. Uh, not quite the same as being there, just smell the food cooking, but it will still be really fun and, and uh, informative. And lastly, I'd like to remind you that the NRI is a nonprofit research organization that relies in part on contributions from people like you. We welcome financial support at any level. And if you are interested, you can see us at uncnri.org slash support for more information. And I think if we don't have any more questions, that that concludes our program. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Kohlmeyer. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.